Good morning, church. Do any of you know how uncomfortable it is to sit on a cow? It's happened to me twice this morning. Where is Joe Ash? He's missing his cow. Turns out it was in my pocket. All right. John 3.16. It's good to once in a while go back to that well-known famous verse, isn't it? John chapter 3, verse 16. Probably don't even have to look it up. I bet you know it off by heart, right? John 3, verse 16, New King James Version says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's a powerful few verses, isn't it? And it is the core of the story of Scripture. It is the core uh, that describes what God would do, the lengths, the breadths, the heights, the depths that he would go to in order to redeem his fallen children. That's you and me, right? Now, the idea that Jesus is the Son of God is not unfamiliar to us, especially if you've spent any time in Scripture. You'll remember a very famous conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. They were walking along a road one day when, when uh, he asked them, so, so who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street? What are, what's going around in popular culture about who I am and, and what I'm doing? And the disciples started chiming in. Well, you know, some say that you are, uh, some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're a famous prophet. Uh, and then he turned the question towards them and said, okay, so that's what pop culture says. What do you say? This was a, personal, a question of personal uh, direction, of personal conviction. And so Peter is the one who speaks up and he says, well, you are the son of God, the Messiah. And Jesus affirms this to him by saying, Peter, this has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood. This was a moment of inspiration. This is truly of God. The fact that you've come to this conclusion, after all you've seen, all you've been witness to, of all you've participated in, that is a very accurate definition of who I am. Now, the term Son of God is actually not exclusive in Scripture to Jesus, right? In Scripture, you will find the term Son of God used in a variety of ways, including for us. In the book of 1 John, Chapter 3, verse 1, it starts with this verse. It says, what does it say? What's that? No, 1 John. 1 John 3, verse 1 says that we are sons and daughters of God. On us That we should be called the, in the old translations, the sons. The new translation will say children. Right, inclusive, male and female, sons and daughters of God. So human beings are referred to as the sons and the daughters of God. In fact, Jesus in the book of Hebrews is referred to as our brother, which implies if, if he's our brother and he's the son of God, then what are we? Well, then we're also children, sons and daughters of God like he is, right? And if you go back to Luke chapter 3, verse 38, where it speaks about the genealogy of Christ and it works its way all the way back to Adam, each time it mentions a name, it says, so-and-so the son of, so-and-so the son of, so-and-so the son of, until eventually you get to Adam, Adam the son of God. Now, of course, Anytime you think of Son of God in that sense, we understand that if you were writing it out, you would use a little s, right? Not a capital S. We are all sons and daughters of God by virtue of two things. Number one, you were created. You were created according to Genesis chapter 1 in His image. You were created for His pleasure, to be a part of His family. You were not designed to be an orphan, that's why loneliness is so horrible to us. That's why loneliness is, is so foreign to us. You know, you'd think that if we were merely evolutionary creatures and it was true that it's survival of the fittest, then the best thing you could be is solo. 
But that's not how the world works. That's not how the psyche of the human mind is, is created. We are designed for community, to be in friendship, to be with one another. That's why I've said to you many times, we cry at funerals. We are saddened by loss. If, again, over millions and billions of years, we, we, you'd think we would have developed a certain immunity to the pain of death if, indeed, we're just here as a scientific accident through natural selection and chance and all the rest, right? Then really death is not a bad thing. It's just the continuation of the process. But there's something about us. We were designed for relationship. And this, this term, sons and daughters of God, that Jesus is the quintessential son of God with a capital S, all of it is saturated with the concept of relationship, the reason Jesus came into the world, the reason that, that, that he was born as man, wasn't merely to give us some knowledge, wasn't merely to give us some abstract truth, some concept. I mean, for instance, like which day is the right day according to Scripture called the Sabbath, right? Which day? The Sunday, the Saturday, the Monday, the Tuesday, which day? It's not just information he came to impart. He didn't just come to tell us that we were, that we were created by a being, an intelligent being, you know, divorced from relationships just as a matter of fact. He didn't come into this world merely to correct us on our understanding of death, you know, that, that when you die, you don't go straight to heaven, as most people would, would, would believe in Christianity, but according to Scripture, you sleep in the ground until the resurrection. There is no point in a resurrection if you already go straight to heaven, right? So he didn't just come to impart abstract knowledge. He didn't just come to tell us that baptism means to be immersed in the water. To be baptized means you go under the water. He didn't just come to tell us that useful, interesting piece of information. You see, the point of Jesus coming into the world was to reveal something bigger than that. Something deeper than that. It was to reveal that you and I are created in community with God. We are an extension of the family of heaven. He came in person to seek and to save the lost because he wasn't just looking to correct our picture or our understanding, our intellectual understanding of what is true and what is untrue. Yes, all of that happens in the process, but it happens in the context of relationship. Which is why you've heard me sing this song many times before, that being saved is about entering into a relationship. Being lost is about exiting a relationship. When Adam and Eve, the, the first sons and daughters of the human race on planet Earth, decided in behalf of all human beings to align themselves with the enemy, they did more than just disobey God. They betrayed him. Do you understand the slight difference in those words? Disobedience versus betrayal. They're the same act, but betrayal has the idea of a broken relationship, being stabbed in the back. The one to whom we owed all things was the one we forsook. We said, we can't trust you. We don't believe you. We think somebody else has our best interests at heart. We think his narrative is the true narrative. So we are going to side with him. They didn't just do something that was wrong. They stabbed someone in the back. They broke a relationship. And that plunged the human race into the chaos that it is now. So it should come as no surprise that the only way back into the family of God is through the restoration of that relationship. Enter Jesus Christ. You see, it's not enough to know the truth. It's not enough just to understand abstract concept. It's not enough just to be, give, to be able to give a reason for why you believe what you believe on any subject of doctrine. You can have all of that right and still be lost. Because first and foremost, salvation is about being restored to a relationship of trust. A relationship that is healed and restored and complete. A relationship where there's communion and friendship and interaction and belief in the only true God. That's why he didn't just neon sign write the right doctrines on the skies for human beings to read. 
That's why he didn't just send teachers and preachers. That's why Hebrews chapter 1 makes the point that that's why he came himself in human flesh. The one who was stabbed in the back, the one who, who, who had the relationship torn from him, that is the one who comes to seek a reconciliation with us. For God so loved the world that he gave, not just the Ten Commandments, for God so loved the world that he didn't just give us a playbook on right and wrong. For God so loved the world that he didn't just give us a set of ethics to live by. Now you'll understand that all those things I'm mentioning, they're included in the Christian walk, right? But that's not how you're saved. See, those things only have meaning in the context of relationship. For God so loved the world... That he came in person, that he gave his only begotten son. So what does that mean? We've said, we've said that sonship and daughtership, being children of God, is not unique to Jesus. We share that with him, with a little s. But no human being is called the only begotten son of God, except one. And that's Jesus Christ. Now, it's not an unused word in other contexts. You will recall a story in the Bible where a funeral procession is leaving a city and Jesus, Jesus comes upon this funeral procession and it's a woman who has lost her only son. Guess which Greek word is used to describe the son? Monogenes, which is the same word that's translated as begotten over here in John 3 verse 16. Now, if you're listening carefully to that Greek word, I'm only mentioning it, not to impress you, but if you listen carefully to it, it's made of two words we're familiar with, or that sound almost like English words. Mono means what? It's singular, one. And genes sounds a lot like what? Generation, to generate, to bring into being. Monogenes means, if you've got a more modern translation of John 3.16, like the New Living Translation, you'll see that they've actually taken the liberty to translate it into its intended meaning. It says, his unique, his one of a kind, his only. So this word, this word that's used for Jesus, is used in other contexts, never yet that I've found in relation to us and God, but it is used in other contexts between people, right? So that, there, so that this woman, who only had one son, her one precious son, there was not another one on planet earth like it, was dead in the box. And Jesus raised him to life and gave him back. Does that make sense to you? There's the story of, there's a, story of a ruler who comes to Jesus. He's got a sick daughter. Same word is used again. His unique one of a kind, only begotten, if you want to translate it into old English. A unique, it was his only daughter. It's the same word, the Hebrew equivalent, that's used, actually the Greek in, in Hebrews 11, when it speaks about Abraham and Isaac. Now, here's an interesting one. How many sons did Abraham have? Two biological sons, right? The first was Ishmael, which never should have been because that was a lack of faith. He took it into his own hands, and he did it by human logic and reasoning, right? But when the Bible refers to the son of promise, in Hebrews 11, it calls him the only begotten, or the monogenes, the one of a kind, the unique, because Isaac was the son of promise. Do you get what this is saying? You see, Jesus Christ is our brother, and if you read in Hebrews chapter 2, it will tell you, it will emphasize the fact of our likeness with Jesus. It says that we have a high priest who can sympathize with us. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17 that we can have confidence in God, confidence in our salvation, because we have someone in heaven who represents us, who is not unlike us. He is just like us. His humanity that he took upon himself, it's, it's, we're not being represented by a foreign agent in heaven. Heaven. The beauty of the gospel is that not only did Jesus Christ come into this world, not only did he lay down his life for us, not only did he restore the relationship, but Jesus Christ ascended to heaven and continues to be our representative. In fact, you know why you can have confidence in the resurrection? This is the logic of scripture all the way through. 
You can have confidence in the resurrection because it's already happened. When Jesus was raised from the dead, humanity was raised in him. It's a done deal. It's signed. Your body still has to catch up with that fact, but it's done. So there is no doubt in our minds about a resurrection and our ability to be resurrected and the assurance that it will happen because it's already happened 2,000 years ago to the quintessential, only begotten Son of God, the unique, one of a kind, no one else like Him. We are all sons and daughters of God, but while Jesus is just like us and we have confidence in our salvation because of that, according to Hebrews, at the same time, just as encouraging to us is that there is also a uniqueness to Him. Him, a uniqueness between the relationship between him and the Father, a uniqueness in the way that he came about. It's called the virgin birth, wasn't it? And if your mind goes back to that Christmas story, so called, the, the story where the angel comes to Mary and says to her, You are going to have a child, a teenage pregnancy, and says to her, But the thing is, it's not going to be the normal way. What's going to happen is that the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you. And the child that will be born to you, the father is who? God. He was the son of man because he was born of Mary. 100% human. And he is the son of God because he was born of God. The incarnation is the story of God dressing up as man. Fully God, fully man. Now, now listen carefully. We're not talking 50-50 because then you're neither of either. Does that make sense? He's all of humanity and all of God clothed in humanity. That's, that's what Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 tell us, right? That, that, that in him, the fullness, not the partial extent, but the fullness of the Godhead dwells in bodily form. So when you talk about the Son of God with a capital S, you are talking about the mystery of how God became man. Fully man, fully God, with one hand holding on to all of divinity and with the other hand holding on to all of humanity. Now here's the important part about this. This isn't just, this isn't just theological theory. Why is this important? Because what it means is that even before the cross... Reconciliation between God and humanity had happened. The cross needed to make it legally binding for all of eternity by paying the debt for our sin. But the intention of God for humanity, the family of earth, and divinity, the family of heaven, to be one was completed at the incarnation where in the person of Jesus, God and humanity was reconciled in one being. That is the power, that is the amazing uniqueness of the gospel story. So when Jesus died, humanity died with him. When humanity was resurrected in Jesus, humanity was resurrected in Jesus. When Jesus ascended to heaven, we ascended there with him. This is the perspective of scripture. This is why Hebrews 11 says that faith is perceiving the things that you've not yet seen, Treating them as real because you've already made it in Christ. You're already there. It's done. Your body will one day catch up with the spiritual reality, but it's already done. See, that's why we have assurance of salvation. That's why we believe firmly that whether we live long or whether we live short, our destiny is secure in Christ because we are already reconciled to God. In your choosing to receive Jesus Christ, in your choosing to be united with Him, you receive the reconciliation of God that's already happened in Him. And that's why it's absolutely foolish. I'm going to dare say it. Absolutely stupid to Christ. Independent of you or your works or of anything you might do, as long as you will receive that gift. And in the context of that reconciled relationship, not only do you have eternity at your fingertips, but you have all the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God with you today, which radically changes and transforms your life. 
But notice this. All that transformation, all that radical change I'm talking about is not because you're biting down harder on your back teeth and trying harder. It's because you're receiving the gift that is in Him. When you receive Christ, it's not just about learning doctrines. It's not just about learning truths. It's not just about abstract concepts. It's about walking and talking and entering into fellowship and relationship with Him. And in the context of relationship, that power that is in Him will manifest in you to change your life and you will experience a transformation. You don't be good to be saved. You find salvation in Christ and He makes you good. By His grace, through faith, with the restoration of a relationship, for God so loved the world that He didn't just lecture us, For God so loved the world that he didn't just send a teacher or a preacher. For God so loved the world that he didn't just give us a book of abstract facts. For God so loved the world that he gave his unique, one of a kind, no one else like him, born of God, born of humanity, son of God, son of man, reconciling humanity and God, formerly alienated in the person of God of the divine human being paid the price on the cross for our redemption so that nothing could rescind the act of reconciliation that he did in Christ so that you and I could have the assurance of his friendship, of his acceptance, of his power, of his grace, and of eternity in his presence represented right now in heaven at the right hand of God is all of humanity in all of what God is, one person, the mediator, Jesus. Jesus Christ. This is your salvation. This is the gift that we have been given. And this is why you cannot save yourself, why you must depend on Him, and why you must come to Him. Because salvation is about restoring a relationship that was once alienation and separation. And the only one who has the power to restore that relationship is the one who was sinned against, the one who was offended, the one who was stabbed in the back. And you have the assurance of that because he came looking for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Didn't lend him not on a time period not for a time period but for all of eternity he was raised in his humanity he ascended in his humanity and he's coming back in his humanity forever the head of our race romans chapter 5 the second adam the head of humanity for god so loved the world that he gave and gave and gave And emptied himself giving his only begotten son. So that whoever will believe in him, will believe in the story, will accept this narrative, who will come to him, will not perish. Will not perish, will not die, but will have eternal life.